go with control, please. Uh, we can advance the slide. There we go. There we are. We're excellent. We're in good shape now. So again, the uh, title for today's webinar is Tardive Dyskinesia, Underrecognized, Underaddressed, and Misunderstood. Um, and this webinar is supported by a donation from the Charitable Foundation uh, from Teva Pharmaceuticals. And we thank them for their support. Let me see if I can advance the slides. I'm I think I will advance them, no? <laughs> well, if you wouldn't mind giving control back to us and then we'll turn it over, it would probably be a little smoother. Um, let me give it a try, or if you don't mind in the short term before we do that, please advance the slides. Um, I'd like to tell folks a little bit about Mental Health America. I don't seem to be able to advance. Dr. Carl, are you able to advance the I slides can't. for us? I can't. I can't. Okay. Bear with us, folks. Appreciate your patience again while we work through our technical issues. Okay. There we are. We We're it. back. So for those of you who are joining us who are not familiar with Mental Health America, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about us. And very simply, our philosophy is prevention for all early identification and intervention for people who are at risk, integrated services and care when people get those services that they need, and recovery as a goal for everyone. And our philosophy at Mental Health America is summed up by our hashtag, before stage four. And throughout today's presentation, we'll be coming back to the concept of before stage four, which is very important to get to folks and help them with whatever it is that is interfering with their lives before it becomes a crisis. No. There we go. A couple of housekeeping tips. Uh, things to keep in mind. Today's webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive a link when it's posted. It will be posted to the Mental Health America website. You are most welcome to share the recording and the slides, which will also be sent to you, with people who have not been able to join today. There will be questions that we'll address at the end, but you can feel free to type questions as we go along into the chat box at any time. And after the fact, please feel free to contact me, Debbie Plotnick, or Patrick Hendry, our Vice President for uh, Peer Services at Mental Health America with any questions, and we'll do our very best to help. Um, we're going to now take a, a deep dive into what tardive dyskinesia is and how it may be addressed with Dr. Christopher Correll, and we're delighted to have him most appreciative, and we're going to begin his slideshow in just one second. Uh, Dr. Correll, you need to put it in slideshow, and we can be off and running. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I am Christoph Correll. Professor of Psychiatry at Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine, and I am considered an expert in movement disorders and antipsychotic side effects, and it's a pleasure talking to you today discussing what tardive dyskinesia is, what we can do about it, and also how it should be diagnosed and treated. This is my disclosure information. I am a consultant, advisor, data safety monitoring board member for a number of companies that are involved in hopefully finding better and safer treatments. What I will cover is what is TD? What are the risk factors? How often does it occur? And how can we treat and prevent tardive dyskinesia? What is TD? Well, tardive dyskinesia is characterized by involuntary, repetitive, but irregular movements, mostly in the oral, lingual, and buccal regions. This means 
that the movements are not willful and under the control of the person who has TD, and that they are not like a tremor rhythmic. Again, the face and the mouth are mostly affected. Tongue protruding, puckering, chewing, and grimacing can be part of TD. Less often, there are movements in the hands or legs, feet, and of the torso. TD can be severe and persistent and also have medical and psychosocial consequences that we'll be talking about in a bit. Interestingly, TD has been described in people with psychotic disorders like schizophrenia even before there was ever a pharmacologic treatment, indicating that potentially there can be some illness-related disruption of the dopamine tone and dopamine network in the brain, which is related to moving, wanting, as well as thinking and feeling. Antipsychotic medications are characterized by the fact that they block or reduce dopamine in the brain. Metoclopramide is a medication sometimes used for gastrointestinal problems and it has a similar mechanism being also responsible for some cases of TD, especially in the elderly, because as you will see a bit later, older age is one of the big risk factors for tardive dyskinesia. The first description came about about five years after the serendipitous discovery of the first antipsychotic called chlorpromazine in the 50s. The pathophysiology, the underlying mechanism in the brain of tardive dyskinesia is not well understood, although we know about this phenomenon for over 60 years. There may be some upregulation of receptors in the brain and hypersensitivity. There may be some oxidative stress or other inflammatory processes, but we are not sure. Since antipsychotics in the beginning have only been used for psychosis, as their name indicates, a lower number of people were exposed for decades to antipsychotics. In the 2000s, it became clear that the newer generation, called second-generation antipsychotics, are also good mood stabilizers, treating bipolar disorder, and that there are also antidepressant in action. Not all of them, but some. Furthermore, these medications can treat tics as well as aggression, which has led to a larger use of antipsychotics beyond psychosis, which can increase the risk of tardive dyskinesia. How should we go about when we see these movements that are slow and rising, a little bit like a screw going about and that are not rhythmic? Well, they are called choreatiform movements because they are these slow and writhing movements. And there are endogenous reasons for chorea, which may not be related to antipsychotic medications, meaning that this would not represent tardive dyskinesia. The most famous and common reason for chorea is a hereditary or genetic reason called Morbus Huntington, where people between the ages of 25 and 50 often develop first psychiatric symptoms, depression, suicidality, and impulsivity, and then often develop movements. Sydenham's chorea can happen especially in youth or young adults and have been associated with a cross-reaction of the body's antibodies against streptococcal infection antigenes. And with that, there is a cross-reaction so that the body attacks a part of the brain that is related to movements, which can lead to often transient movements that mirror chorea, 
but those usually go away with time. Benign familial chorea is another genetic reason, and then we have another number of medical conditions that would have to be ruled out, particularly in somebody who is medically ill and develops these movements. But antipsychotics are the one medication group that has been most associated with tardive dyskinesia. As mentioned before, we have to differentiate involuntary movements that are part of tardive dyskinesia from other movements. Mannerisms are semi-purposeful movements where somebody, because they're a psychotic, might repeat certain gestures. Stereotypies are repetitive, complex movements that are meaningless, like uh, pounding the hand on the chair or on a table. Ticks are quick and repetitive movements, and some of you may have heard of um, some people who have both motor ticks as well as verbal, and um, so they have muscular ticks in the face often, but they can also um, have ticks of that uh, emit some voice-like activity. A myoclonus is quick but regular whereas tardive dyskinesia is more slow. Dystonias can happen with antipsychotic medications, and they are characterized by the holding of a muscle group that is contracted, which can be quite painful. There is also a tardive dystonia syndrome that can happen with antipsychotics, where, again, a muscle is pulled the whole time rather than it being a movement. Rider's cramp, for example, is a typical dystonia. A tremor is rhythmic and regular. And then another antipsychotic-related side effect is called akathisia, the inability to sit still, which is an inner restlessness that can also lead to the shifting of one's position and um, being uncomfortable within one's skin. Now I'm trying to advance my slides. Can you maybe help me? Sure, we're working. Oh, there okay. we go. Good, thank you. <laughs> so in order to diagnose um, tardive dyskinesia, one needs to characterize the movements. The most commonly used scale, rating scale for this, is called the AIMS, the Abnormal Involuntary Movement Scale. This is a scale that rates seven different areas of the body from a zero, no movement, to minimal, mild is a two, moderate is a three, and marked or severe movement is a four. In order to diagnose tardive dyskinesia, having ruled out other potential reasons, one Criterion is to have at least two ratings of mild in any of these seven body regions or one region being rated as moderate, at least a three. So you need at least one three or two twos. Again, muscles of the oral and facial region are most affected. Therefore, there are four of the seven ratings in that area. Then we have the upper and lower extremities, and we have the trunk with back, shoulders, and hips. Ultimately, one can also rate the overall severity of the movement. In people who are receiving antipsychotics, one should perform ideally an AIMS exam before the medication is started to rule out abnormal movements independent of antipsychotic treatment and then perform the AIMS around six monthly with the older first-generation antipsychotics, FGAs, and at least yearly with the newer second-generation antipsychotics. Now, tardive dyskinesia is of concern because it can have an impact on people's lives and their functioning. And the second presenter will actually indicate this to you. 
What are the areas of potential impairment? The first have to do with the motor system, and there it matters where the movements are and whether the patient or person has actually been using these movements in either communicating with others or at work and so forth. Speech can be affected also through a lot of movements. Dentition can have um, problems. If there is a lot of opening and closing of the jaw, there can be pain. There can be swallowing difficulties if the muscles inside of the mouth are affected and the swallowing muscles. Fine motor skills uh, can be affected if the person has finger and hand problems with the movements, which can interfere with writing or typing. Gait and posture can be affected, as well as strength and power. Also, when people have these movements in the face, other people might look at them strangely and think of them as being odd. This can obviously lead to self-awareness, also anxiety, worsening of suspiciousness or paranoia, isolation, feeling stigmatized, and also withdrawing from people, not sharing any social events anymore or not going to work because of being self-conscious, because the movements might interfere with communication skills and social interactions. Awareness is not always um, fully there in patients with tardive dyskinesia. It really depends on where the movements are and how much the patient has um, um, contact with others who might point out the tardive movements to them. So in one study, mostly of more chronic schizophrenia patients, two-thirds themselves had not full awareness of the movements that they displayed. What are the risk factors? This is relevant. Unfortunately, women are at higher risk for some reason. Older people, the longer the treatment with the dopamine-blocking antipsychotic has lasted, higher doses, and the occurrence of early movement disorders, stiffness or restlessness or dystonia, indicate that the dopamine system of that individual person is more challenged and at risk of having tardive movements. Masking the early stiffness with side effect medications is not recommended. One should rather lower the dose so that the stiffness, the early muscle stiffness, can abate. White and black people are at higher risk than people of other races and ethnicities. People with mood symptoms or disorders, pre-existing movement or cognitive problems, people who have comorbid alcohol use or substance use or diabetes, and people with HIV are all at higher risk for TARDIF dyskinesia. How often does TD occur? It really depends on where we look, when the studies were done, and how the assessment is done. I will not go through all of the studies that we've done and also recently compiled because it really depends on individual risk and it depends on whether small movements are being detected or whether we need someone to be aware of the movement or the movements having a functional impact. So in one study that we did, basically one out of seven or 13%, 15% of people who were on antipsychotics or had been on second generation newer antipsychotics displayed symptoms of TD, whereas with first generation drugs, it was actually up to one in three people. We recently published a large meta-analysis of almost 12,000 people and 40 studies showing that when one looks carefully and focuses on chronically ill patients, almost one out of five people can have some movement disorder that seems to be tardive dyskinesia with the newer agents and almost one out of three with first-generation antipsychotics. However, looking at the last bullet, in people who have never had the older medications, 
the risk was only 7%. So older medications really carry a higher risk, most likely during the treatment, but may also convey that risk when people are switched to newer agents. Looking at incidence, that means how many people get Tardive dyskinesia within a year in more controlled settings. It was when we look at the same age group, adults, a 600%, six-fold higher incidence with haloperidol, 5%, one out of 20 per year, whereas uh, eight out of 1,000, so less than uh, one out of 100 um, being in uh, having tardive dyskinesia with the newer agents. So this tells you that these movements are not totally gone, even with the newer agents. But when you look at older individuals, the rates are about five times higher. So instead of 5% per year, it's now 25%. And after three years, it's almost half of the people. So the elderly should not get first-generation antipsychotics. And even with second-generation antipsychotics, a study that we published uh, a couple of years ago showed that over a year, there was basically, with the medications, 6 or 5%, 4 or 5% of people had TD, and at the end of two years, 7 and 10%. So again, elderly patients are at highest risk. How can we treat TD? Up until this year, there was no Food and Drug Administration approved treatment. Everything was off-label and not really evidence-based. When movements occur and you can get rid of the antipsychotic, people can be moved to other treatments or do not need long-term antipsychotic treatment, then stopping the potentially offending medication is the first step. When that can't be done, maybe a dose decrease can be helpful. Sometimes the dose is increased, but that might only mask or subdue the movements, which then later down the road will come back. Switching from higher risk to lower risk agents, that is from the older to the newer antipsychotics, or switching particularly to clozapine have been found to be effective. Then a whole gamut of different treatments have been tried that are listed here, none of them really having full evidence for achieving FDA approval. But tetrabenazine, an older agent, had been approved for Morbus Huntington, and since Morbus Huntington, as I said earlier, is associated with Korea, it had also been used off-label for people with tardive dyskinesia. However, tetrabenazine can have quite a bit of side effects, including suicidality and depression, for which it has a black box. The two new treatments that were approved this year, do tetrabenazine, or called ostero, and valbenazine, called ingreza, are modifications of tetrabenazine or medications in the similar group that have better safety profile and each did not receive for tardive dyskinesia a warning for either depression or for suicidality. So let's go into the mechanism of these new two, two new treatments. They are both VMAT2 inhibitors. VMAT that stands for vesicular monoamine transporter. So basically, for the brain to communicate and release neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft, from, that's the communication from one neuron to the next, there needs to be a storage of that transmitter. And that is stored within this vesicle presynaptically. And in order for the neurotransmitters, including dopamine, to be packed into this bubble, you need a pump. And the new medications block this pump and have less of dopamine available that is being released and can stimulate the movement. <clears throat> 
Dutetrabenazine is a modification of tetrabenazine and has to be given twice a day, not once a day, but also not three times a day as tetrabenazine. It is also approved for Huntington's disease. Dutetrabenazine is called Dutetrabenazine because deuterium is a stable, naturally occurring, non-radioactive hydrogen that increases the bond of the molecule so it has to be broken down more slowly and is better tolerated by the body. The, one of the trials that showed that dutetrabenazine is effective is this, where against placebo in gray and blue, you can see that over a 12-week period, there was a significant reduction in movements that was separating at week four. Dutetrabenazine needs to be titrated, so increased in dose over time, but then it was nicely sustained until month three. That was the first study. Also, side effects were not higher with the medication than with placebo. It was very well tolerated, including restlessness, and there was also no higher rate of depression or suicidality. The other study uh, compared different dosages, showing that the two higher doses, 24 and 36 milligrams, reliably separated from placebo in gray, again showing nice separation and reduction of these movements. Looking at a 50% improvement reduction in symptoms, we can see that one in three patients at the end of 12 weeks actually had the reduction by half of the severity. Then if you look at the full year, this is an extension study, what was gained within the first 12 weeks was sustained for the rest of the year. Here we have clinical global impression change, so who is much or very much improved based on the assessment of the clinician, and you can see that there's nice increase to almost three out of four patients at the end of the year who are much or very much improved. Valbenazine is the second, or Ingrezza is the second medication. It has a longer half-life and can be given once a day. There were also two pivotal trials, and one of them is shown here, where placebo is in orange, and the two doses, 40 and 80 milligrams, separated as early as week two. This medication does not have to be titrated with weekly steps, so this was a six-week and not a 12-week study, showing that the higher dose was better than the lower dose. Here you can see, again, people who have uh, an improvement over time, and again, 40% had 50% reduction in their movements by the end of week six on the higher dose. Here, too, side effects were very limited. In this study, the one-year extension similarly to dutetrabenazine, showed that, yes, patients who had improved by week six improved further and kept the improvement. Then, for the last month, the medication was stopped. And you can see that, basically, patients regressed back to their baseline severity, indicating that, like with insulin for diabetes, we are not curing the illness, but we are suppressing sufficiently the symptoms for patients to benefit from the treatment. How should we then go about treatment with antipsychotics and prevention of tardive dyskinesia? To prevent TD, we should only give antipsychotics when it's really necessary, at the lowest necessary dose, and for the shortest needed time. We also should avoid doses that cause early stiffness or dystonic reactions, 
and we should consider second-generation antipsychotics whenever possible. Furthermore, monitoring is important so that we become aware of the earliest manifestations of the movement disorders and can then start addressing them either by modifying the treatment or by using some of the newer treatments. In conclusion then, tardive dyskinesia is a potential adverse effect of dopamine blocking medications. It can impair functioning and quality of life. We can prevent it having a careful indication for antipsychotic use, using conservative doses of antipsychotics, avoiding early stiffness, considering second generation newer agents, informing patients and caregivers of the risk so that they can self-monitor and that they're aware that this is a possibility, and assess for the beginning signs of tardive dyskinesia every three months during the beginning phase of the treatment and during maintenance phase less frequently. When tardive dyskinesia occurs, we should manage it nowadays with on-label approved medications which include Ostedo and Ingrezza or Dutetrabenazine and Valbenazine. I thank you for your attention and look forward to the discussion at the end of this program. Thank you so much, Dr. Carl. That was extraordinarily uh, informative um, and a deep dive was just what we all really appreciate. We're going to move now to Patrick Hendry um, who is Mental Health America's Vice President for Peer Services and Recovery. And um, we're pulling up Patrick's slides, and we should be ready to go in a second or two. Um, just a little bit of wrestling with uh, getting control back. Patrick, we will um, advance the slides for you once we get this all functioning, and that will hopefully keep things smooth for the rest of the presentation. Um, Very good. So. Okay, Patrick, we're ready to go. So go ahead, Nicholas. Well, as Debbie said, my name is Patrick Hendry, and I'm uh, Vice President at the National Office for Mental Health America. I'm also, obviously, since I'm talking about living with tardive dyskinesia, I'm an individual who lives with a psychiatric disorder, um, probably um, my first symptoms started in my late teenage years, but it really became a problem for me more in my 30s. And like many other people, I went through a number of uh, years where no treatment seemed to work for the symptoms I was experiencing, multiple hospitalizations and, and real disruption in my everyday life. After about 15 years, um, I was prescribed an atypical antipsychotic that actually worked. Uh, but at the time, there was no discussion of tardive dyskinesia as a possible side effect. Um, medication was very effective in treating my disorder, but approximately six years later, I was sitting at home one day with my wife, and she asked me why I was moving my tongue in and out of my mouth. I said, what are you talking about? And then I realized that I was. As a little bit of time went by, the symptoms became a lot more apparent. I had tongue movements where I, my tongue would protrude from my mouth or wander around my mouth, which sometimes made talking difficult. I had tightness of the jaw and chewing motions. Uh, later on, it started movements of involuntary movements of my fingers and toes, and sometimes even my uh, legs would move on their own. And then I had kind of a stiffness or inability to, to, to walk straight, so I had kind of a crooked gait um, that began to cause me problems. Next slide, please. I decided that I, uh, you know, I, I had worked in mental health at that time for about 15 years, and my wife was a therapist, so we were both fairly familiar with these symptoms, and we realized that this was probably tardive dyskinesia because it was six years into the medication before it appeared. So we, we decided that it was unlikely it was a type of EPS. I went to my psychiatrist, talked about the symptoms. He observed me and prescribed uh, one of the older medications that's frequently used for movement disorders, but is not really well known for working well with tardive dyskinesia. Uh, 
But for me, it did work. It effectively suppressed the, the TB symptoms. The problem was after a few years on that medication, I started noticing some profound memory loss. And then eventually, and then eventually um, I noticed that I was uh, getting confusion. I would mix up words. I'd lose words when I was talking. Um, eventually, I started uh, getting lost driving home after work in the daytime. Next slide, please. So I decided I better check with a neurologist because I wasn't sure what was going on. Um, I was diagnosed very quickly with mild cognitive impairment, um, but those symptoms continued to get worse, and I was eventually diagnosed with early onset dementia. And I was treated with two of the most uh, current uh, Alzheimer medications. Getting a, a diagnosis of dementia, a possibility of Alzheimer's because of uh, a history of it in my family, is a very scary thing. Alzheimer's is a, is a fatal diagnosis. Um, and so I wasn't really sure how this was going to affect my life. I wasn't sure if I would be able to cope with the stress that it created. And I did go back into therapy after many, many years of being away from therapy and having found my own way to recovery. But I soon realized that I was dealing with it okay, and I stopped the therapy. I was at a workshop one day where I was presenting on how uh, you can educate people about the types of medications they take and what the possible side effects were. And there was a doctor that I knew there, a psychiatrist, who was presenting on uh, the use of atypical antipsychotics and their side effects and treatment. And he was talking and he said, a lot of people use a, a, a particular drug, but I never use that drug because it's well known to cause dementia-like symptoms. I went up to him after the uh, talk and I said, you know, Rajiv, I'm having these symptoms. And I went through the symptoms I was having and his advice to me was stop taking it. Next slide, please. So I did. I stopped taking it immediately, and within a month, the dementia-like symptoms started to go away very quickly. Um, the TD symptoms came back, um, but they they remained kind of relatively mild. I'm, I'm very lucky in that sense. I have, you know, a full range of symptoms, but um, they tend to be more prevalent early in the morning and late in the day, and so they don't have a major effect on my day-to-day my -day work life. Um, in the last couple of years, I've had the chance to travel around the United States and meet with groups of people who are living with TD. And a majority of the people I spoke to noted that they were never warned about the possibility of tardive dyskinesia when they were prescribed antipsychotic medications, just like I had not been warned. warned. Nearly all of them did not start having the TD symptoms until at least three years from when they started taking the uh, primary antipsychotic. Uh, many of them had to go to their doctor multiple times before they were ever diagnosed with tardive dyskinesia. It seems that a number of psychiatrists are not really familiar enough with how to diagnose TD. And only about half of the people that I met, and this was uh, uh, series of 10 focus groups that I did around the country, only about half of them received any type of treatment for their TD symptoms. Um, and the ones who did, a majority of them have really significant side effects from that treatment. Next slide, please. Also, nearly half of the people that I spoke with have um, said that TD has a, a major negative effect on their quality of life. You know, for some people, the effects of TD are so uh, debilitating that they're unable to go about life in, in any way that they would have chosen for themselves. Frequently, people misunderstand the symptoms of, uh, of TD and they confuse it with the symptoms of the underlying mental health disorders. And they think of it as kind of the face of, of people living with mental health disorders. Um, there are new treatments out now that bring hope to the hundreds of thousands of people who are living with tardive dyskinesia. And I can just say I am one of the very lucky ones because for most people living with TD, 
It robs them of the chance of living the life they desire. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, for sharing your personal story and um, unfortunately reflects so much of what Dr. Correll did. I'm going to very briefly talk about some of the policy implications around diagnosis and treatment and advocacy for moving things forward with respect to TD. Um, I just wanted to do a little bit of review because I want to reiterate the point that we heard from Dr. Correll and again, um, in Patrick's story, most individuals aren't told of the risks, but most of the time it's caregivers, as we heard in Patrick's story, with his wife who notice those symptoms. And um, we are doing this presentation for the first time in November, which is National Caregivers Month, and I can't stress strongly enough the important role that caregivers have in the lives of the people they love and work with all the time. And so we wanted to do this webinar to really bring attention not only to individuals who may be affected, but the people who care uh, for them and they care for as well. Um, Patrick was very strong about doctors not looking uh, for TD, but Dr. Carell was very clear that they should be and they should be monitoring. So these are things we need to keep in mind. Again, I wanted to reiterate that the primary symptoms have to do with the mouth and tongue, but they could also be otherwise. Um, and sometimes just one part of the body is affected, which translates to a rather low aim scale. And that's an important thing we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, one of the things that we'll be moving through is talking about prior authorization and step therapy often requires all types of medications, including benzodiazepine um, and other classes which we heard about um, from Patrick and from uh, Dr. Correll. And many of the medications that are used to treat TD, if and when it is recognized, um, are very sedating. So they in and of themselves can additionally interfere with people continuing with their lives. We heard a lot from Dr. Corral about tetrabenazine, the old standard treatment, the serious side effects. And one of the things that's very important um, in uh, use of tetrabenazine is that it's contraindicated with a lot of the medications that are often prescribed for, under, for the underlying psychiatric condition that folks may be taking. And of course, um, Dr. Corral was quite clear about its increased risk for depression and suicide, so much so that it carries a black box warning, which again is very important for folks who are dealing with an underlying psychiatric condition. We know that there are two new treatments, um, and uh, there, we're going to talk a little bit more about some, next slide please, um, Sorry. Uh, we're working on that next slide, about some of the impacts of TD, and then we're going to move into some of the barriers and advocacy things. But I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story about um, an advocate who worked at one of our MHA affiliates. In fact, it was an affiliate that I had worked um, at, and which was how I became aware of this person's story. And while she worked at this affiliate before I came, her name was very well known because the organization, the MHA affiliate, had a special um, memorial that was for her, that, um, and it was a fund, and it benefited the employees of that affiliate. But the reason I mention this story is that this advocate, who was a very strong and successful advocate, was in fact a person with lived experience. And she had successfully been managing her recovery, medication was part of her regime, and she did in fact developed heart of dyskinesia, and as a result of the diagnosis, she died by suicide, and that's how there came to be the memorial fund for her. So every time I, in my work at Mental Health American across the country, as an advocate and working on systems, I think about that person, I think about her story, and I bring that to you all in helping to understand just how devastating it can be to receive a diagnosis 
in the days when it was believed there were no treatments or certainly no adequate treatments. Um, we heard about uh, please. We heard about <clears throat> how the um, treatments. In, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my place. Here we go. Um, the effects of TD are very individualized, and that's really important. So Dr. Correll spoke a lot about how it's often the mouth and the tongue, and Patrick talked about how that affected him. Also, um, his fingers and his feet. Well, these are the kinds of things that can, again, they are individualized, and the effects of that individuation there might interfere with someone's job or someone's ability to uh, engage in their everyday activities of life. But the biggest effect of having a TB diagnosis um, may be that the person isolates. And social isolation has such negative effects that it is deleterious upon one's longevity as is smoking. And I wanted to quote um, another um, researcher in uh, tardive dyskinesia. Uh, he gave me permission, Dr. Stanley Carl, to quote him. He said, the need to treat TD depends on the degree of a patient's distress and the interference of symptoms upon the person's life. Again, reiterating just how individual the effects of TB can be, and what's most important is how much it's getting in the way of someone's quality of life. There we go. So we've touched on these things a little bit. Improperly and untreated TB has employment consequences. People lose their job. Not only can they not perform their functions, but sometimes the effects of TD, whether it is grimacing or involuntary movements or pointing or things like that, can have such a negative effect that folks often lose their jobs because of it. Or they may feel they can't do it and quit their jobs. There's also incredible negative effects upon personal relationships. People sometimes lose their friends and it impacts people's intimate relationships with their partners. Another consequence is that often folks are taking off medications that are working for them in second generations that uh, are working well for them, uh, and that adds to uh, their distress when their psychiatric condition is no longer being managed by medications that work. Again, um, the social isolation, go on. Thank you. Um, we heard about failure to look for and diagnose TB. That's a huge barrier to treatment. Another barrier that we've learned about is that often folks are afraid to disclose that they or their loved ones are noticing symptoms of TB because, one, they're afraid of being diagnosed because, like, the woman at the MHA affiliate, they might believe there's no way to manage the condition, or they're afraid of being taken off of medication that is working well for them. There's a huge barrier that we're finding out more and more about is the new treatments. The treatments that Dr. Carl spoke about are often being excluded or facing very steep uh, prior authorization um, kinds of criteria. We'll get into that in a second. And that's a huge barrier for accessing the treatments that now exist. And the criteria to newer treatments are often themselves based on outdated recommendations. Next slide, please. Okay, we're moving on to that next slide. There we go. <clears throat> so I just wanted to touch a little bit on how to advocate for yourself if you're unable to access treatment uh, for TD, for yourself or for a loved one. And one of the most important reasons we're very um, delighted to be able to bring you this webinar today is that we hope it will be very helpful in educating the individuals who are listening now, who will listen online and share information with their friends about the symptoms of TD, about old treatments and their uh, attendant problems, about newer treatments. Um, that are now available. <clears throat> if folks are being denied the newer treatments, 
one of the advocacy steps they can take is to, number one, appeal and ask for the diagnostic criteria that is necessary for medication approval under your plan's um, step therapy or fail first, as it's often known, policies or prior approval. Many medications, in fact, you'll find that most of the newest medications do, in fact, have prior approval um, criteria. That's not improper. It just You just need to make sure that what that prior approval is based on is in keeping with what we have learned from Dr. Correll and what is known about PD. I want to encourage people to protest any criteria that includes um, <clears throat> having to reach an AIM score. Dr. Correll spoke earlier about the AIM scale that um, is more than three. Some of the um, plans that we have become aware of require a 10 on the AIM scale, which, is, which would mean that many, many body parts are uh, associated with what the person is experiencing. And as we learn today, it very often folks with PD just experience one body part, meaning that it is highly unlikely that there would be such a large AIM scale. We've also seen the ESR rating scale being something that must uh, reach a certain criterion. And the reason I mention this scale is that it's not commonly used in uh, practice by clinicians. It's more of a research scale, so it's unlikely that that even would be part of a person's record. Um, another thing to uh, watch out for it, that if it's required that people go off their meds um, as a first step before they can access any TD treatment, that should certainly be questioned rather than, as Dr. Correll uh, talked about, adjusting the dose. Um, if the steps require including the use of tetrabenazine, and we've spent a lot of time talking about the contraindications uh, of using uh, tetrabenazine, including that it is also explicitly not to be used with other medications that are commonly used to treat um, mental health conditions. There's also, as we know, the side effects and the increased risk of depression and up to and including suicide. So insist that if you are going to have to um, have an appeal, that what matters are not scale. What matters is how your own life or the, uh, or the life of your loved one is impacted, that that should be the major criteria for the degree of how a, um, a person is impacted and whether or not treatment is indicated. Um, and so we're now, we got a couple of minutes, and I wanted to get some questions. Do we have some questions in the chat box? Uh, we're going to unmute everyone, um, and uh, we, have a, we have a few minutes to uh, do that. Questions, folks? If you were not speaking, would you be so kind as to mute your own phone? And, and then we will be able to uh, ask questions. Do we have some questions? So what you're saying is you... I'm afraid we, we can't... We think there's a question, can't quite hear it. Do we have any questions for our presenters today? Well, yes. Anything in the chat box, yeah? Just um, whether you uh, yes, this is Tiffany. I have a question. When will the slide that you presented be posted? We were unable to, to log into the room to see it online. Um, we'll have it up within a week, next Friday. We're, gonna, we're all going to go home for, for our Thanksgiving holiday, and we'll get it posted next week. 
everyone who has registered, whether you're on right now or you have registered um, and were unable to join us today, will get an email when it is posted. You will have the slides. They'll be available for download, and the recording will be available also for you to hear. So you will have both of those things. Um, any other questions? Well, hearing none, I would like to again thank Dr. Uh, Christoph Carell for joining us. We are most appreciative for Patrick Hendry for sharing his personal story. And please, can we move the slide? Um, here is our uh, contact information. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to email me on Debbie Plotnick or Patrick Hendry. If you have a question for Dr. Carell, we'll be very happy to forward it to him. And again, we will do our very best to be of assistance to you and make this information available. So thank you again so much for joining us today. Thank you.